Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 221 of the All Dolphins podcast. This is a very special edition, as you can see, uh, by the gentleman in the square, the rectangle, actually. Can't, don't even know my geometrical shapes. The square below us, former Dolphin three-time Pro Bowl selection, Keith Sims, Look member of the Dolphins from 1990 through 1997. Keith, how are you, partner? I am great. I uh, appreciate you guys having me. I want to say I am a fan of your podcast. You keep me up to date on what's going on and behind the scenes in the Dolphin world. So I definitely appreciate it. It's an honor to be part of your podcast. And you like the history lessons, which is unbelievable. You know, it's it's very interesting that there's a segment of the fan base that absolutely loves the history lessons. Mm -hmm. And then there's a segment of the fan base that absolutely hates the history lessons. And and that's well, just what society is. And, and absolutely. It's 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 so amazing that, but I enjoy it because it, it it allows me us to tell stories. Like I've really enjoyed when now that we've done the seasons, okay. That and, and now that I've been part of these seasons to be able to tell the stories that I have from them. Well, I definitely appreciate them, and, and I'm amazed, Alan, at your ability to remember all these small key facts. I, I don't remember all of them from my years in the Dolphins, so you're educating me as well. Thank you for that. Oh, much appreciated, as I as I will do because I love doing this. Uh, oh, it's not producing it. Oh, yes. There we go. <laughs> um, and the bottom line is, judging by the comments, more people like the history lessons than not. So guess what? We're going to continue doing them. Having said that now, this is episode 221. So we're going to talk about 2021. This was the year of the great comeback. Omar, if you recall, Dolphin started off 1-7. and seven. Uh, Looked like all hope was lost. That included like cl some close losses. Tua was out for three games after getting annihilated by AJ Epinesa in week two against the Buffalo Bills in a 35 nothing loss, no less. Dolphins got to one, one and seven. Brian Flores, to his credit, did a masterful job of having his players not quit on, on him or the season. Held Dolphins. it all together. And it was probably one of the best coaching jobs I'd ever seen in Dolphins history. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that they had a great roster, but the fact that he took such accountability for the slow start and and the issues, and they could have they could have quit. They I've seen so many Dolphins teams quit, and they never did. And then Allen give them the history lesson on the rally back. Well, they rally back. There you go. That's, 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 no. I, I'm playing. So the Dolphins proceeded to win. I want to say six or seven in a row. Put themselves lo and seven. behold. Seven in a row, lo and behold, at eight, seven, seven in position to actually make the playoffs until a rainy, soggy, cold day in Tennessee where it all fell apart. Oh, yeah. That was the first instance of Tua not delivering in clutch when his team needed him to be clutch. Second? Which one was the first? The, the first was the 2020 season finale at Buffalo, even though he wasn't it wasn't nearly as bad of a performance by Tua. But in that 34-3 loss at Tennessee. That was rough. Okay, and and playoffs were on the line then, yes. Which one? The twenty twenty. Oh yeah, yeah, the fifty six twenty six loss. Yes, the playoffs were on the line, okay, and the Bills, bad. the Bills had nothing to play for, but they played their big guys anyway for the first half, early in the third quarter, and then okay, time to rest. And then Dolphins wound up winning their last game against New England in that twenty twenty one season, thirty three twenty four, to finish nine and eight, a second consecutive winning season under Brian Flores. After which, there were some massive changes. Hold on, we, 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 you, you, you're kind of glossing over the Tennessee drama that happened after the game. Well, this is yours. This is your where, history. Where, 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 where Brian Flores and Tua have a blowout in front of the team where Tua curses at Brian Flores and tells him, F you. And if you know Tua, yeah. that's amount of volcano erupting and that was the relationship was severed it was never going to be fixed because flores supposedly blamed tua for the loss th that they had and his and basically put it all on tua and tua blew up at him and from that point the players knew like oh whoa these two they're ne they're not going to work together and then individuals in the in the coaching staff um, to save themselves, they went up and they started snitching. 
um, and snitched on a lot of things related to Brian Flores, who already didn't have a good relationship with the owner, with management, and ultimately, subsequently, he got whacked for it was okay when you didn't have a good relationship with owner and management that, but then when you didn't have a good relationship with the quarterback that they had sacrificed and purged and, and you know, tanked. and tanked for, it was over. Uh, yeah. And no, it wasn't all on Tua that 34, three loss. No, but it let's, wasn't. Well, but he played booty cheeks. I mean, he was booty fine. cheeks. Yes. Okay. Let's take a history lesson further back in time. The year is 1990 and the dolphins have, uh, picks in the first and second round, and they double up, did a very smart move, and set themselves up for the left side of their offensive line for several years to come, including the selection in the second round of a guard from Iowa State by the name of Keith Sims. Um, having mentioned Iowa State, let's start with this, uh, Keith. Brock Purdy, Iowa State, so obviously a little crushed about the Super Bowl, or are you okay with this? I'm not crushed. I, I was in a win-win situation watching that game. I know Brock Purdy, obviously, I was a famous Iowa State Cyclone, was back at school in November, so I had an opportunity to meet him a couple times uh, a couple years ago, and I'm very happy for his success and what he's been able to accomplish. Uh, Did you the same see token, this? I was Come on. Did you full- see this, Keith? Did you see it coming? Mr. Relevant? No, I didn't. I, you know, he, he was a great quarterback at Iowa State. He, he was very similar to what you're seeing in the NFL. We had great priests. Brees Hall was an outstanding – obviously, you see with the Jets right now – outstanding running back. We had a couple of wide receivers that were really good in a tight end. Charlie Kohler, who's with Baltimore Ravens, who was good. Head coach Matt Campbell, love him to death. And it was a really senior-led bunch. They ended up going to the Fiesta Bowl a couple of years ago and winning the Fiesta Bowl, which is unheard of for Iowa State football. So that class that came in together with Brock Purdy stayed together for those four years, and they accomplished a heck of a lot at Iowa State. So very happy for what he's done. That being said, I do recognize the pieces around Brock Purdy. He has such great talent on that team, and I think that has also elevated him to his success. People say game manager is a negative thing to say in the NFL. He is a great game manager. He's got some mobility, tricky mobility that people don't realize. And I saw that at Iowa State, and you see it in the NFL now. I think he's risen to the moment. Is he a top 10 quarterback? That's a debate other people can have. He's definitely a top 15 quarterback. Statistically, he's number one. Statistically, he's... Omar, Omar. But I ask you this question. This is the debate I have with a bunch of people this week. If you took Brock Purdy and put him on the Dolphins... I'm not sure if he's a playoff, if the Dolphins made the playoffs last year. Now, if you took two and put him on the 49ers, do, I don't know if they beat Pat Mahomes, but they're, they, don't, they don't have a drop off at all. So I have to take that into account, the, the pieces around him, both offensive line, tight end, running back, the defense they had. I mean, you have five, six all pros on your team. You should be one of the best teams in the NFL. By the way, Keith, Keith I'm sure aware of this, but this is Omar, Omar and passer rating. <laughs> okay. I mean, and and there are not enough hearts. There are not enough hearts to convey the actual true meaning there. You know, it's, the question is: Would you take Brock Purdy over Tua to lead this team in the next couple of years? And that when I you would. start asking that question, I don't know. And I love Brock. Like I said, I love him as a player, individual. What he's done so far, and I don't that would be, that would be a hard debate for me because mm-hmm. I think the body of work for Brock isn't big enough. But That's then. Cool. Tua's durability is all is there. Um, I, I have seen Brock Purdy rise to the occasion where I have not seen yes. Tua rise to the occasion. Omar, Omar, allow me to jump in, and this is where okay. do your do your thing, Omar. All right, let's on AllDolphins.com Friday, I think it was. I did a story examining Tua versus per- Purdy. Oh, did you? Yes, specifically because it, it's a good comp, and where there's a big difference between the two is in every clutch metric. Mm-hmm. where Purdy is right up there and Tua is right down low. Um, and that's So to is me, the that's clutch right. metric because of Brock Purdy's play and ability, or is it the pieces around him that make those catches and get open and give him opportunity? Tua's yeah, got pieces yeah. too now. Correct, thank you. Yeah. Tua's got pieces too now. There well, is know something he's got about – the best receiver in the NFL. But tight end-wise, he doesn't have a George Kettle piece. They don't – I mean, as, as good as – Raheem the line is the year, same. you know, Christian McCaffrey's a different level running back. 
Ayuk is a good receiver. You got Debo Samuels, who, who's a knife, a, a jackknife of all different. So those pieces are pretty unique. I know the offenses are very similar. That's why I brought it up there. The offenses are the same. Um, they just utilize the tight yeah. end way more than Miami Dolphins do. Um, I yeah. think they probably throw to the backs probably a little bit more than Dolphins do. But it's a very similar offense. I don't know where I would where I would go on that. I think if they were had the mm-hmm. equal amount of time in the league, I might and and we see what we see. I might go with Purdy. I I, I really would because of that clutch gene. I mean, look okay. throughout the entire playoffs. He delivered, yeah. and if you're going to hold the Super Bowl against him because he's kicking for three instead of going for going for a touchdown, you know a, a lot of things go wrong well, in a game. It's not his fault they missed. Oh, the absolutely. Game. It's not his fault. Yeah, they I think he played the well, game. particularly in the first half of that game. Yeah, but even you no, know, in the yeah. fourth quarter, the Forty Niners did not lose because of Brock Purdy. That's correct. You know, they did not lose that game because of Brock Purdy. Okay, let's go back to your Dolphin days. I mentioned you played for the Dolphins from 1990 through 1997, at which time you went to the Washington, then Redskins, now Commanders. Um, played under both Don Shula and Jimmy Johnson. So yeah. I guess first big picture question, how do you look back on your time with the three po- three-time Pro Bowl selection, I should mention. How do you look back on your time with the Dolphins? I absolutely loved my time with the Miami Dolphins. I think as you get older, you appreciate it more and what you went through and the things you accomplished uh, than in the moment. In the moment, you're just enjoying it. You're thinking about, hey, my career, what I'm going to do here and there. But as I as I get older and look back on it, it was some pretty special times in Miami. A little disappointed in the way it ended because I was a Shula guy. Obviously, I was drafted by Shula. Uh, he helped me become the player. I was a Pro Bowl player that I wanted to be. And then you get a guy like Jimmy Johnson come in and his coaching style was totally different. And we didn't mesh very well. And I didn't understand what he was trying to do. You know, he came in and we had obviously Marino, we had Richmond, myself, we had Brian Cox, Troy uh, Troy Vincent, Marco Coleman. We had a, a set group of veterans. And I can remember sitting in that locker room after practice with Dan and Richmond, like, we don't know what the heck's going on. He treated us, us veterans established as dirt. And we didn't, I didn't understand that. I kind of got a little insight of the way he coached when I watched the 30 for 30 on the U. And then I was like, okay, I see what he's trying to do now. This is obviously years after I retired. So I didn't have that ability to, to help me understand him when I was playing. But I can remember one time, you know, Trace Armstrong was on the team and he was the president of the Player Association. I was a player rep. And I, I don't remember if it was his first training camp or the second training camp. You know, traditionally you get 24 hours off, you know, every week during training camp. Well, he wanted us to report early afternoon on Sunday after a preseason game. So, of course, us players were complaining. So Trace Armstrong and I have to go up to Jimmy's office and say, hey, the union rules say we get 24 hours off. So he cursed us out for about 10 minutes. And then he said, okay, I got something for you. And he called a team meeting. We all go down to the team meeting in Davie. And he walks in and he says, okay, I hear you guys are complaining about not getting your 24 hours off. You've got two choices. You can either come in here tomorrow at, at 1 o'clock or I will start the 24-hour clock the minute we walk off the field and we will be in full pads at midnight Sunday, Saturday. So what do we do as players? Yeah. We relented. I mean, that – But I know that kind of put a target on my back. He did not like the fact that I was a union rep. He did not like the fact that Trace Armstrong was a union rep. And he didn't like the fact that I had a pretty good connection to the media. He wanted to be the superstar of that team, and his voice was the only one that he wanted out publicly. And when other people talked, he did not like that. So we did not mix very well. Um, But correct me if I'm wrong, and then going over your career transactions before you came on, didn't he resign you to like a five-year contract after he got here? Yeah, and then he uh, then he asked me to take a pay cut year two. Oh. I had here's the crazy thing: I had tendonitis in my elbow. We took an X-ray. We're gonna go in and have surgery. We're playing Tampa Bay Sunday night on ESPN. Obviously, I had to go into Warren Sapp. We get out on the field. We're talking before the game. Warren's not going to play. I'm like, okay, so I don't have to play. No, no, you've got to play. First quarter, I go out there, I get tripped, I hit my elbow, I hear a pop. I'm like, something's wrong here, guys. Come in, just tape it up. 
So, of course, I go out there and try. We tape it up. Doesn't happen. That morning, I'm in the MRI tube, tore my tricep off the bone. So, of course, I'm going to, to IR, right? Because especially back then, everybody, oh, no, no, no. You can come back. That was the beginning of the end of my time in Miami. They tortured me in rehab. They made rehab the worst experience of my life. Finally, I think it was the about four games left. He kept, comes out in the paper, kept saying, oh, Keith Sims healthy. He's ready to come back. I couldn't even bench the bar, yet I'm healthy enough to play in a game. So they gave me a rodeo brace that locked my arm out like this. I'm going to be the emergency lineman. Somehow they put me in the game in the second quarter. I, it was either two or three plays in a row I got holding on because my arm's wrapped like that. He pulls me out. Just, and he says, hey, you know, in the paper the next day, Keith Sims was healthy. I don't know why he got those penalties. So, of course, I had to answer, no, I wasn't. I'm not healthy. Next week, we're playing Detroit on a Sunday night game at home. I get the flu. I come in. They say, go home. Don't be on the sideline. And all the reporters talking about during the game, the, the, the uh, broadcast, well, where's Keith Sims? I know him and Jimmy Johnson had a beef. Well, next day after the game, he calls me and says, Keith, it can't be you or me. It's me. I'm cutting you. I'm like, well, I'm not healthy. He said, file a grievance. No, be my Did guest. You? Did you? I'm like, I know my rights. Well, unfortunately, the next day, the Redskins and North Turner called me and said, hey, come on up. They checked me out. They said, we know you're not 100% healthy. We just need you to be an emergency lineman. I was like, cool. He signed me. Had a great time in Washington. That's why I resigned with Washington after that. So Jimmy and I did not see eye to eye. Listen, and I know those are those are the stories that the average fan do not see okay. because mm -hmm. this league and this sport it's ruthless. Yes. Um, and and when they when they seek we see weakness, they they seize on it. And yep. wow, I didn't know that story. Um, <laughs> well, I got more, but <laughs> <laughs> by all means, by, okay, by all means, please, the pleasure, the pleasure, Keith. Oh, no, no. We'll get into that later. If it comes okay. up naturally, we'll. Oh, okay. Organically. Uh, uh, yes. I hate to br oh, let me ask this. And I hate to bring up a bad memory. Oh, let me add to that story, okay? Oh, so he cuts me on a Tuesday. I get five stations. They, they call me up. They come into my house to interview me. I'm living in Weston in a rental house because I was building my house. And I'm smiling ear to ear in my interview, my post dolphin interview. They're like, you seem happy. I said, you know, I'm kind of relieved to be out of here. My football career is not over. Now, Jimmy tried to blackball me after that. He tried to call the Redskins and say, he's made money. He's fat. He's out of shape. He doesn't want to play anymore. Thank goodness I had in the personnel department, Chuck Banker, who was at Iowa State with me, was in there. And when they brought me in, he said, hey, Keith, you got to come in and keep your mouth shut. We don't want the union stuff. You can't be a locker room lawyer. You just got to come out here and play. We believe in you, but you just got to play because this is what Jimmy's saying about you. So, okay. So that was great motivation for me. It, it is, it's traumatic. And when you said player rep, mm -hmm. that's the one thing that I was like, uh-oh. Um, yeah. Especially when during that era of two-a-days and yeah. grind it out, mm -hmm. the, they did not like the people who stood up and still don't like the people who stood oh, up yeah. and advocated for the players and players' rights. What do you think about this new era of training camp and mm -hmm. player treatment and CTE concerns? I mean, we all know the game is just brutal. I would not recommend – I know you're coaching now on a high school level, but mm – -hmm. We'll get to that later. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do not recommend football for young people especially unless you're 14 and you can okay. consciously know what you're getting into. You're smart enough to know what you're getting to. I don't recommend it, but do you understand why they've rolled back a lot of the stuff for care? As a, as a former player who was just recovering from my second knee replacement surgery, which was my 17th surgery because of football, I totally understand it. Sometimes I get frustrated as a former player and say, you know, sometimes the play on the field is not as good as it could be because maybe they're not practicing enough. But I completely understand the, the trade off here. I would rather be able to stand and walk and not have the back pain I have every day if we had practiced differently. I could have played longer 
if we had practiced like they practice today. And CTE is no joke. Myself personally, for myself and my family, I have taken part in, I would say, four or six different CTE head trauma studies, Harvard, NYU, Duke, North Carolina. I went to the University of Pittsburgh a year and a half ago because I've told my wife, I've got young kids at home. My 14-year-old son is a freshman at my high school. He's playing football. I've got two other kids. Hold, I've got two older kids. So I want them to understand how dad is and remember how dad is. If I have some issues, which I thank God I don't, and I've been tested, I wanted to know about that. I know a lot of players don't. I wanted to know about that so I can maximize this time with my family, my wife, and my kids. So it's I applaud these players now. We didn't have the ability to not play hurt, to not put our careers or even our, our post-football life in jeopardy. We had to do what we had to do. Shula's last year in the first was the first or second Shula Bowl in Cincinnati. I broke my big toe on the final drive. I stubbed my foot in the ground. I heard it pop, boom. I hopped off the side, off the field. And the first thing Shula said to me was, get back in there. So I hopped back on the field. We finished the drive and we won. Well, I couldn't wear a shoe on that foot for the remainder of the season. I couldn't practice because my, my toe had bent up like this. It was so deformed. I shot it up for 13 weeks straight. Numbed it up, numbed it up, numbed it up and played through it. Ended up, we played in the Meadowlands against the Jets. And I remember it being in tears on the plane coming home because the numbing medication had numbed, had, had worn off and the pain was so intense. And finally I had to take a week off after 88 straight starts for the Dolphins. Let, and let I ask- did that because Shula asked me to. And then not knowing they were going to push him out because it was a contract year. And he said, I'll take care of you. And then they bring Jimmy in. And I tell you my first meeting with Jimmy, this is again why Jimmy and I didn't get along. He said, well, you know, I know you made your third Pro Bowl but you didn't play that well. And I said, well, I was hurt. I was playing on a broken toe. He said, well, you didn't play for me. <laughs> that wasn't for me. And I said, oh, oh okay. Well, that's how this is going to go. <laughs> you know. But that was the start of our relationship. Yeah. Let me ask you, and I, I, I asked this question because I know I have seen the different eras of football. Poop has seen way more different eras mm-hmm. of football than me. Calling me old? Yes, always. <laughs> um, Ancient. How many shots would you say throughout the course of your career would you estimate that you took to play the game? Now, are you talking about numbing shots or are you talking about Toradol? Because those are two different things now. Oh. So there were twice in my career, I can tell you, where I took the numbing pain medication for about 13 weeks each. One with the toe we just discussed. My final year in Washington, I just signed a brand new contract. We we knew we were going to the Super Bowl that year. The year before, we had lost in a division round on a block field goal to Tampa. The year they went and beat the Rams and went to the Super Bowl. We had Champ Bailey, Daryl Green. We had signed Bruce Smith. Uh, we had this great, great – Deion Sanders was one of our cornerbacks. We had a team, and we knew Brad Johnson – uh, I forgot my Stephen Davis was our running back. We were the second ranked offense to the Rams in the NFL the year before. We were going to go to the Super Bowl. So I hurt my Achilles. I think it was the second game. Woke up, couldn't walk on it. Had to hop to my car, drove to Redskin Park, got in there. We did an MRI. They said, Oh, you just strained it. Can't get any worse. So I said, Okay, do I need rest? Next day I get a call. Come on in. So I come in to get thinking of getting. Uh, treatment and they're like well Norv Turner wants to see you okay no problem so I go up to Norv's office and I love Norv Norv is a wonderful man great man go to his office and the owner's in there so it's the owner and Norv so we're sitting there and he's like how you feel blah blah I said oh no I can't I can't play this weekend they're like Keith your backup is terrible we had a rookie from Stanford Brad Badger like he cannot play we cannot put him on the field doesn't matter what you do, I need you to play. You don't have to practice, but I need you to play. So I was like, okay. I, again, I was just signed a brand new contract, three years. I was in my 11th year. In my mind, I'm going 15 or longer. So 
I've got to be honest. That year was the most fun I've ever had playing football. Showed up in the morning. I did my lift, went to the meetings. By noon, I was done. I didn't even have to stay for practice. I had my own column on the Washington Post. I did a movie review, and I had a little segment on Fox where I did a, a movie review as well on TV. It was awesome. Did that for 13 straight weeks. Boom. Shot it up. Game day. Didn't practice all week. Then they fire North Turner with two weeks to play. Two weeks left to play. So I'm like, okay, come in on Tuesday to get my treatment. And Terry Rubisky is now the interim head coach. So he's like, Keith, I need you to practice. I'm like, whoa, Terry, I haven't practiced in two and a half months here. He's like, well, I need all my leaders out on the field. Talked to the trainer, said, you should be okay. So I go out there, I practice Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We get on a plane, we go to Dallas to play the Cowboys. Big rivalry game. We win our last two games, we're in the playoffs. The third play of the game, I'm blocking, I think, Demetrius Underwood. I hear a big oh, pop. Boy, I think I get that's kicked. A name. That's a name. I get kicked in the back of my heel. I'm like, oh, who kicked me? And I look around and there's nobody there. Achilles. And that's when I realized I tore the Achilles. Like, goodness. So they, Dr. Andrews comes out. They bring me on the sideline. I take my, my John Deere into the locker room, not knowing that was going to be my last play of my career. I tore it really, really bad. And then, unfortunately, at the union meeting that, that May or that March, I tore it again. So I had two tears of my Achilles within six months. And then I had an infection and it didn't, it didn't, the, the wound did not heal. So I spent 11 days in intensive care trying to save my foot because they had to transplant. I don't know if you can see this from my, I'm going to go over here. They had to take skin oh, okay. and veins from yeah. my arm to heal my Achilles and then take a skin patch from my hip to heal this. 11 days, and I almost lost my foot. That's how my career ended. That's crazy. Um, fun fact, Terry Rubisky, one of, the, one of those people who actually played and coached for the Dolphins. Yep. That and, I, and I like Terry. I understand what he was doing. Now, the question I have always asked myself is, if I did not practice, would I have made it to the final two games? And then my career would not have ended. So – you would have had like, the whole off season to rehab and you would have continued to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, now, now to answer the question, put a number on it. How many shots okay. would you think? He's avoiding the question. He's yeah. avoiding. Well, I will tell you this, just those two instances was 26 pain numbing shots. So it's at least 26. Those were probably only two major times I ever numbed my a body part. Now, Toradol is a different thing. I discovered Toradol. In the middle of my career, one day I'm looking at why are guys lining up to get shot? What are they? What are they? What are they lined up for in the lock? You know, before the game. Oh, you got to get a tortle shot. I'm like, okay, so I jump in there. Well, what does it do? It's supposed to take take the. It's like a big anti-inflammatory to help the help you feel better. So I oh. started taking that. You know, so that was probably a couple years of of doing that. You know, not more than four or five. But would you would you long. do it in an area of concern or would you just? I I, I don't understand. No. You just, it was just, hey, take the shot. You'll feel better. You won't have as much inflammation, as much soreness. Those kinds of things. I had a, a good friend of mine who was a nurse. I remember I was with Washington, I think, and my knee was, was bad. I mean, I've had nine, 10 knee operations uh, really bad. I had to wear knee sleeve, two knee sleeves every day just to practice. So they started giving me an anti-inflammatory called Indocin. I don't know if you ever heard of Indocin. No. Well, I told this to my friend who was a nurse and she was like, stop taking that immediately. That's a horse in anti-inflammatory. That's not supposed to be for humans. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. But I had been taking it for every day just to practice and to play. That's what we put our bodies through back in the day. That's why when people talk about players today, I'm like, hey, I'm glad they have the leverage that we never had, where if they're truly hurt, they can make decisions. Now, like, as much as I want to be there for my team, I need to be there for my the rest of my career and my family as well. I, I think that that's a – I'm glad you're saying this and shedding light on this because I think that that's an important conversation that people don't understand or have. And, yeah. you know, I'm a certain host I'm who's sitting to the left wearing a Montreal Expos hat – 
You know, he always wants to poo-poo the injuries at the end of the season. And yes, everybody's injured at the end of the season. Sorry, what? But when you have to take a shot to play a game, I'm sorry, you cannot sit here and expect great results from You're that. not the same. It is not the same. But Keith, again, barring barring having your elbow that can't that can't straighten out because mm -hmm. it, got a torn muscle. Yeah, that sounds a little ridiculous, Keith. And yeah. I'm, I'm, that's your bad. I'm sorry. No, no, you you, you had to bully you into playing. I'm sorry. That's crazy. Okay. Omar, let me let me let me. Different speak. time. Different time. In 2023, if you're out there playing, you are expected to perform at a certain level, regardless of the injury, unless it's an injury that would keep normal anybody out. Normal. Or you have to pick horse 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 pay, horse shots. Yes. But, yeah. Injuries are definitely part of the game and they definitely affect players. And, you know, Shuli used to say, are you injured or are you hurt? And, and that was the mantra they used to say, are you injured or are you hurt? Everybody's hurt. But if you're injured, you can't play. Never defining what the difference was, just putting that out there for you. You can't make the club from the tub and all those kind of things. And it was a pride thing, too. You didn't want to, to not be there for your team. You didn't want to not be there for the guys you you sweated with and bled with all off season long. And in Miami, the expectation was we're trying to win a Super Bowl. We're trying, we're a playoff caliber team. So it, it was a lot of pressure. And I know we weren't the smartest back then, but again, there was no leverage back then as a player. You know, it didn't matter what you, I had a five-year contract and Jimmy cut me in year two. Year two. So you didn't have the huge signing bonuses and the cap ramifications that you have today, where as a player, you can say, I can make a true business decision and realize, hey, if they cut me, they still owe me $10 million or whatever it is. I only made $10, $10 million my entire career in 11 years, you know, before taxes. So it's a different world today than it is then. And, and I, I'm glad, like I said, I'm glad the players have progressed to get to that point. You Let mentioned me Shula, hold on, you mentioned Shula earlier. I wanted to ask you about playing for Don Shula. Um, <laughs> The 1982 AFC Championship game, which was the last time the Dolphins have gotten that far, being there when Shula set the uh, the career record uh, yep. at Veterans Stadium on that ugly day, and then in, in being with him in his last season, can you like summarize all those elements? Ooh, well, first of all, that 92 AFC Championship loss was the worst loss of my career. I don't think I left my house for a week after that game. We were so sure. We were going to go to the Super Bowl. In fact, I told my mom, don't even come to the game. My dad came, said, don't even fly down. We're going out to California to play the Cowboys next week. It was devastating because we had beat the Bills once that year. But they came out with a great game plan. And I don't know if the Bills get the level of respect that they deserve with the, the caliber players they had on those squads. It, it was a back and forth. It was always a battle between us and – and, and the Buffalo Bills, and I truly think they kept kept me out of two Super Bowls, two opportunities there. And that loss was was rough at home. I still can see Thurman Thomas slipping out to the left, Marco Coleman coming up field on the rush, and another slip screen Green for another left. ten or fifteen yards. It was just it killed us. Um, that that was really really frustrating. And even though we were there, I think that was my third year. Mm -hmm. I I just knew we were going to be back. And we never could get back to the AFC Championship game after that. And that was frustrating because I personally wanted to get Dan there, not just for him, but for me. I wanted to play in the Super Bowl. That's why you play this game as an opportunity and didn't get that opportunity. So, so that was a really, really rough loss. Now, now, you talked about being part of Shula's 347. That was a true honor. I remember I think he got the 300. We were playing the Packers at home with Don Mikowski, and we won that game. Uh, so by. that, yes got the fumble. That was a great honor to be part of that. But I was one of the guys that dumped the water on him when he tied the record. And then he was on my shoulders when we broke the record. So I will always look back fondly on that and saying it was great to be part of that, to help that man who I loved, help that man get to where he wanted to be. And I'm selfishly kind of happy that Belichick didn't get another job because I don't want Shula's record to be broken. Not, not by Belichick. And I, I Great things that he's done, but I just I'd like to see Shula keep that record. I want to ask you about that Marino era, and I have always. First off, I'm a I'm a I'm a chubby chaser. I love line play. That is my thing. I I I watch the trenches. 
And I, I know think, you do, and I and I appreciate that. I think subconsciously, maybe the fact that I grew up watching you and Richmond Webb and that line from Marino, it created an appreciation for line play. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always wondered, why is it you guys never had could have a running game? Why is it that you guys could never give me that balance that J- John Elway okay. finally got that allowed okay. him in the later stages of his career to, to get to that Super Bowl? And yes, you, you didn't get a Hall of Fame running back as an undrafted player. Yes. But the commitment was but never there, Keith. It, well, number one, the, co- the, the commitment wasn't there. And, and I understand it. You think back to a couple of years we had Irving Fryer, Mark Ingram, Keith Byers, Keith Jackson, Terry Kirby. Are you taking the, the ball out of their hands and Dan's hands to get them playmakers out there versus handing it off to our Irving Spikes? Or oh, I love him, Bernie Parmalee. We never had a great running back. And I didn't understand a great running back until I got to Washington. And I blocked for Stephen Davis. And I had the opportunity to see what a difference that makes. You mentioned Terrell Davis. He was an X factor for John Elway. When they had Terrell, he's a Hall of Fame back. He was something special. When you have a special running back, it's a lot different. It's a lot easier to hand it off to that guy and take the ball out of Marino's hands because I can tell you, sitting at huddle, there were so many times. I remember my rookie year. I remember we, I can't remember we were playing. We were playing at home. And him and Clayton were talking. Dan and Clayton were talking. He's like, just throw me the ball. Dan just said, if I nod to you, run this route. It'll be a touchdown. And sure enough, I saw him nod, and it was a perfect strike, inside route, touchdown. That's what Dan brought to the table. His ability to understand what defenses were trying to do to him and be able to capitalize on it. And as an offensive lineman, it made our job a little bit easier, to be honest with you, if we spread teams out and say, okay, now you got to declare. We just have to be responsible for these four or five guys of course, as guards, we had dual reads. You have to read a safety or a corner. Is a corner going to come or not? But you can you can understand if a corner's coming, he's not backed up by a safety, he can't blitz. So I don't have to worry about him out there anymore. I just got to worry about the guy in front of me. So it was – I get it. I We wanted to run the football, trust me. As offensive linemen, we wanted to run the football. We always wanted to get at least 100 yards rushing every single game. But at the same time, we were winning – and Dan was one of the best quarterbacks I've ever seen, and I was an honor to protect him and play for him. So taking the ball out of his hands was tough. So that's a tough decision. Now, let me ask you, parlaying it to this Dolphins team and how, how much you pay attention, how much do you think they had the number one rushing yards per average attack? I think they yep. were number six in running the football. But they were still, according to some people, wearing Montreal Expos hats, a finesse team because they ran laterally and, mm-hmm. and how much do you think yeah, tell him he's wrong tell him he's wrong please Keith how, how much do you think adding a hammer like Derrick Henry would change the dynamic Ooh. does he fit into the offensive scheme because he's not going to be the smoke and mirrors guys going left to right he's going to be pounding it between the tackles which hey Derrick Henry's a talent he's a freak of nature he can make any team better. It's can you utilize his talents within the strength of your offense? And then you say, every time you hand the ball off, you're not giving Tyreek an opportunity to, to go deep or Waddle an opportunity to be the defense. So sometimes you can have too many weapons, and then it's hard to disperse. And I don't know Tyreek. I don't know Jalen Waddle. You know, I, I know my Clayton and Duper days and my Irving Fryer and Mark Ingham days and Keith Jackson. They all wanted the ball. They all said they were open. So I don't know if that still happens today, but that can be difficult for a quarterback to manage that. Now, with Dan, it was a little different. He would just curse him out and go. (laughs) It was Dan Marino. I don't know if Tua has that level of command of the offense. And if you don't, I know you – I listened to your podcast before you talked about Brandon Marshall. When he was here, you have some of those guys. They can destroy a team – and an offense, so you have to be careful what you ask for sometimes. Yeah. But I would like to see a big physical back to see when it gets colder, when it gets in playoff time, and they need to pound the ball in between the tackles that they have somebody to do that. So they can stop being a finesse team, like I've been saying. Right, Keith? Come on, say, uh-huh. it. Hey, Keith, gonna say it. You want to say it. So, But my thought is if It's you- a self-fulfilling prophecy. We've said the finesseness for the last 10, 15 years. When I got to Washington, they said I couldn't run block. 
because we were in a pass offense. Well, we, we were we led the NFL in rushing. Our running back led the NFL in rushing. I'm pulling and trapping on counter tray left and right. We're blocking all up. And, I mean, it was just we didn't do it. You know, I didn't have the running back to execute that. But we were we were not a finesse offense in Washington. We were a physical pound the ball offense. Yeah, that they, that was yeah that was North style, North Turner yeah. style. Mike, Mike Mike McDaniel is the is a finesse guy with the motion, all the bells and whistles and all that. And I that's kind of what the 49ers do also. It's a lot of mystery. I saw it last night watching Super Bowl. They got back on their motion. At the end, of, they're just trying to confuse the defense and get that leverage, and it works. But when it doesn't, when they figure you out, we saw what happened later in the year when you got physical teams, and when it's third and two, can they get that two yards? That that to me is the balance between yeah, you stretch teams horizontally and you stretch teams vertically, but with a Derrick Henry, and I'm not saying that this has to be done, but you have to put an mm -hmm. extra man in the box. Okay, now when you put an extra mm -hmm. man in the box, what do you do with Tyreek and Waddle? So it's it's like a and yeah. and this is no disrespect to Raheem Mostert. I have a tremendous amount of respect to Raheem. I understand, but. You need that hammer. You need that sledgehammer, yeah. and and it's it's something that's that's not here. Um, poop. What, what what you got, poop? But but can I, they find one like the Chiefs got in Pachenko? You know, he's not a huge, he's not a big kid, no. but he runs hard between those tackles, and he slithered. I mean, he's a he's been a shock. He's been a big surprise coming from Rutgers University and what he's done. Obviously, I follow Rutgers because I'm from Jersey, that kind of thing. So I know who he is. But he he's a pounder in there. Yeah. He runs like a crazy wild man. It's like hair on fire. Uh, you mentioned this. You alluded to this earlier. I wanted to ask you, Keith, about uh, your current role as O-line coach at, at Second Juror High School in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, yep. And you mentioned your, your son. I'm going to assume that your son's on the team. Is this is this a, a case of you wanting to spend time with you, your son doing that as, as in the process or is now coaching in your future and this something you want to pursue beyond perhaps high school? No, nothing beyond high school, I can tell you that much. And, yeah, this came about my son, my wife would not allow our son, his name is KJ, Keith Jr., wouldn't allow KJ to play tackle football until seventh grade. So we played in the youth league, and I helped coach that. And he, he did okay. He had a little talent. He's a, he's a very tall kid, tall and slender right now. He's, he's bulking up, but he's tall and slender. He's six foot two already, wears a size 14, and he's only 14 years old. Oh, jeez. So he's got – a wingspan. He reminds me of like Jason Taylor, that wingspan along. So I always say, watch Jason's video. That's what you can do. So he was going to be going to high school. And my wife and my sister were like, well, if you're concerned about his coaching, why don't you coach? I'm like, it's a brand new high school. This is only second year in existence. So I reached out to the head coach and I was like, hey, I don't know who you are. I'm Keith, blah, blah, blah. There's my resume. Um, <laughs> interested. Can you help um, coaching? He was like, "Got." I did it on Twitter. And he got right back to me. Hey, Keith, he was from Florida. I know who you are. Can you come in and talk to me? So I sat down and talked to Coach Hill, and they hired me. I was like, great. So my son was still in eighth grade last year, uh, and he was doing GFL. So I was trying to coach high school and then run to his GFL practice and help out there. Well, that was tough because I was getting home at 630. His practice started at 7. But his staff, the staff on that team was not very good. I'm like, you asked me to be here, and they were doing some things that I thought was dangerous. So my son tweaked his shoulder. He said, I don't know if I want to do football anymore, Dad. I'm like, well, I don't care if you do it or not, but you're, you're not quitting. I asked you multiple times in the offseason before I picked that check down, do you want to do this? And you said, absolutely. But, but the more I got into it, I was like, you know, I don't trust this staff with my son. So I made him a deal. I said, I will let you – Stop playing football this year. But next year when you go to high school, you got to play two sports. I don't care what they are, but you got to play two. And this offseason, you got to work out. So he was like, great, I'll do that. He became our ball boy for a high school team. So the first Friday night lights, we're out there before the game, and his eyes are this big. <gasps> Dad, this is great. I can't wait to get out here. I'm like, are you sure? Because you're just seeing the payoff. You're forgetting all the work that went into this. Absolutely, Dad. He worked hard in the offseason. Eighth grade team came to the weight room. He lifted. He worked out all summer long. And we didn't have a freshman team. He ended up starting at defensive end at 150 pounds for our JV team. And in the beginning, a little rough around the edges. But by the end of the year, he made two incredible hits. Put the quarterback out of the game. 
on the game. So now he's in love, but he's a big Dolphin fan, by the way. We watched Super Bowl last night together. Uh, loves the Dolphins, loves Tyreek and that kind of stuff. So um, I got into coaching to be there as part of my son's journey. And once he leaves high school, I don't know if I'll continue to coach, but I'm having an absolute blast. It's been a very unique challenge when you're starting up a high school. My first starting offensive line, I had one sophomore and four freshmen, and my heaviest player was 200 pounds. I had guards at 150 pounds. So we got our heads beaten. We were 0 and 10 first year. Last year, we were 3 and 7. This year, we get an opportunity to compete for regions and states and playoffs. We change regions, and we have, unfortunately, the toughest region in the state for our group. But if we win our last three games, we're in the playoffs at the fourth seed. So that's my focus now with our guys. Love working with these kids. They're, they're different, very different than we were, than I was. But we got a good group of kids. And it's the number one. It's the first AI school in the state of Georgia. It was the model for the United States. So it's an incredible school for my kids to be in. So I'm really looking forward. I'm having fun. We got a good, good staff. Our head coach from year one got fired. So we got a new head coach. And we got a great mix of players. We got a great mix of coaches. We've got some older guys like myself. We've got our, our new quarterback coach is fresh out of college. So we've got a great staff, great mix of guys, and it's been a lot of fun. I'm enjoying myself. Nice. I, I wanted to ask you about this generation. I mean, you, you're dealing with your son, so you, he's probably the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, this generation now with transfer portal, NIL mm -hmm. deals, um, you know, you come to the NFL, you want to tell mm -hmm. coaches how you're going to practice, what what you're going to play, how you're, what style, you know, I need this many – it's a it's an era of entitlement and it's not just football it's yep. it's it's every sport mm -hmm. is this healthy for athletics you know they just approved a couple of months ago nils for high school in georgia mm -hmm. which we're all like oh my goodness what huh? what what yes. does that mean yes so high school players can now go get sponsorships and they can't use the school name but they can be sponsored as an individual player and make money so I can so, get a car to go play for a high school. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. So I'm concerned this transfer portal is very difficult now. You know, I'm not surprised Nick Saban retired because dealing with that every year, players leaving you every year, you can't stack a team. It's hard to compete. That can't, can't abuse I live a player. Miles from Athens, you can't, so you can't I, abuse I, a I, player, too. Remember yeah. that. It, they, it's... they can go. They're making millions – First of all, what's going on with six and seven year players? A ninth year player at the University of Miami. I'm mm -hmm. like, this is crazy. But I understand it. if I can play another year and make a million bucks while I'm in, in college, why not? I would do it too if I had that opportunity. So this pl these players are different on the high school level, and I see they're different on the college because if, if you get, get adversity or you don't want to wait, I'll just jump on the transfer portal and go somewhere else. We didn't have that opportunity. I almost transferred to Iowa State. I was going to transfer to Pitt because the coach that well, I got recruited from Pitt, I chose Iowa State. My coach that recruited me, Frankie D'Alonzo, went to Pitt after my freshman year. I called him up. I'm not happy here. Come on out. So I went to visit. And I remember when I went there, I came back. They're like, yes, we'll take you. No problem. I was like, what about my scholarship? Oh, you got to pay for your first year. That conversation did not go over well with my mom. She's like, no, you're going back to Iowa because we don't have money to pay for a year of college for you. So I went back to Iowa and it worked out, which was great. But we didn't have that portal jump where you want to get out there. I mean, I, I do recognize that as a player, you come to a university, not just because of the university, most of, most of the times because of those relationship with the staff and that head coach. And when the head coach leaves, it's not always fair to the player. So they should have an out too. But this just transfer for any reason, I just – maybe I'm too old school. I think it's very frustrating. And NIL deals where you're paying these kids millions of dollars. The Georgia quarterback just bought a Lamborghini. The well, Lamborghini. I'm I told mean, he makes $4 million a year to play high school. Play, I mean, play college at Georgia. College, college. You know, and I'm all for players, college players, getting money. I can remember not having money to eat meals on sun, Sunday night or – not having laundry money or money to take out a girl on a date. That's not right either. But 
maybe the pendulum has swung a little bit too far the other way. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I sound like an old school guy or not, but that's just how I feel. I, I wanted the door open as well. Um, and I think the pendulum has swung a little too far. I wanted it to benefit everybody. And it only yeah. seems like it's benefiting a select few. And I understand fair market value and, and yeah. you know, but right now, everybody has it better than NFL players. NFL players, the team drafts you, they got you. Yeah, they, you got they, you for three, four years? Yeah. Yeah, th you know, th three, four years. And now, hell, you're in you're in college. You don't like where things going. You don't like the coach, the way he talked to you. Uh, you could go leave and you could transfer to his rival school and nobody can stop you. And it and, happens all – you had guys jumping from Georgia to Alabama, Alabama to Georgia. In fact, I'm sure you're familiar with the player Caleb Downs. His, I know his daddy. Now he's from the high school two miles from my house, Mill Creek. So I, I've known him for years about how he grew up, and he's an outstanding player. Well, he goes to Alabama freshman of the year, and Nick Saban retires. So I understand he leaves. But now he's at Ohio State. Boom. I mean, it's it's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. But um, But as a fan, now you have an opportunity for your team to get really good really quickly. Free agency. So, yeah, it is. Well, Look what Deion did in Colorado. I mean, it's crazy. Oh, hell, um, you don't. You don't have to tell us. Well, Deion, Deion will tell us how great he did in Colorado. <laughs> oh, don't start with poop. No, yeah, yeah. I, I, so that's, I do want to ask that. you, Keith, because mm -hmm. I remember when I was gr growing up, you were praised a lot because of the businesses that you had, the Dunkin' Donuts, the Subways. Mm -hmm. um, one, you still have those businesses. How well are they doing? <laughs> And what advice would you give to a draft pick? What advice would you give to Cam Smith? He just made $6 million, you know, living in Miami. What advice would you give him from a business standpoint? Well, unfortunately, I sold my shares of the business before I moved to Georgia about seven years ago. So I, I look back on that decision and say it was good at the time, but – I wish I still would have had the business because I want my kids to understand that. And they don't understand that opportunity. My older kids used to work and sweeping up in my Dunkin' Donuts and they, they saw dad working within that business, but they don't understand the power of a business to be an entrepreneur. So my advice to any young NFL player would be number one, get a good manager who can help you financially manage your money that you trust. Number one, and don't give anybody, ever power of attorney to do what they want to do. And you've got to be on top of it. If you don't understand money, then your number one job as an as a NFL player is to educate yourself on money, interest, investments, understand all that. Don't just trust somebody else. And the next thing I would say is find a business to buy, open, start, venture. The tax advantages of owning a business are too great not to be a business owner. You can start small, but you got to be involved. I went to Dunkin' Donuts school. I went to sandwich school. I went to scoop school with Baskin Robbins. So I learned how to do that stuff. So I knew how to run the business inside out because I will tell you something about Dunkin' Donuts. They do not teach you how to make money. They teach you how to make donuts and coffee, but they don't teach you how to make money. And it cost me 100000 my first year in business. We were negative 100000 the first year in business because I didn't understand it. People I hired didn't understand it. And I was still playing football for the Redskins when I bought it. So get involved in something before you leave the game. Leverage it as much as you possibly can. Can we assume you make a mean cup of coffee then? I don't even drink coffee. <laughs> you know what? Ooh. My wife drinks coffee. Don't get high on your own supply, right? Even though I ate a bunch of donuts when I was back in the day. Okay. <laughs> Uh, back then, yeah. So, but yeah, um, no, I'm not a coffee drinker. I can make you a good cup of coffee to Dunkin' Standards, but uh, I do my wife's just about every morning. But other than that, yeah, I'm not a coffee drinker. I had a couple, couple of quick hitters here. Um, Absolutely. Funniest teammate you had during your time with the Dolphins? <sighs> Funny. Oh, my goodness. Funniest teammate. I haven't thought about this one. Oh, Lordy, Lord, Lord, Lord. I was going to ask you best play, best teammate you had, but I'm I'm afraid you're going to default to Marino, and that'd be too. too no, hard. he's going to say Richmond Webb. Best team I ever had was Richmond. Okay, cool. come on, how do you not by know far. that's the answer? I got to think I'm the funniest one. Why, why, why is I Richmond not? In, why is Richmond not guy? in the Hall of Fame? You know what I would say, Mark Kids. 
I would say we, that's a whole discussion we've got to push because Richmond Webb deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. I have no idea why the NFL and the Dolphins have not put that thing together. His resume is impeccable. Played against the I mean, when you come out of the gate as a left tackle, seven straight pole bowls, two or three all pros, I mean, come on. And he's the reason why we're able to compete with Buffalo. I mean, yes, I helped him a little bit, but Richmond deserves to be in the NFL Hall of Fame. Tell me, if I'm, tell me if I'm crazy here, Keith, because I've always thought my recollection is Richmond, mm -hmm. he may, his best year may have been his rookie year. I mean, he came in and he was a stud. I mean, oh, from he, he, was a, he was definitely a stud his, his rookie year. I was, let me think of his, mm, I don't know if his best year was his rookie year. I think he was shocking to the league that he came in and was so proficient. And it's a, you know, quick story. I met Richmond at the combine for the first time. We're sitting in the stands, you know, waiting for it to work out. And he's like, hey, I'm Richmond. I was like, I, I know his name. So we started talking and we're looking down at the lineman workout. And I'm like, did you make All-American? He said, no, I didn't either. And we're looking at some of the All-Americans like, man, they can't even move. You know, we never thought we would be teammates in Miami at that point. Yeah. Since I was the number one rated guard coming out, he was the number one rated tackle. I thought for sure. I was going to be a first-round pick and no way near Richmond. But um, Richmond was a, a great player, a great friend, um, not getting his due as far as the Hall of Fame is concerned. And Richmond was a funny guy because he would always complain in my ear. Our lockers were next to each other. He would always bitch and complain in my ear. And I was dumb enough to speak it out loud or reporter. <laughs> so I was the one that got called into Shula's office multiple times oh my I, goodness for i am that guy to keith okay. people it, no matter what it is including our media contingent you put you put a battery in my back i'm the one that's going to go fight for for you and then yes. i'm the one that gets the the, the 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 arrow shot at me because i'm fighting on behalf of everybody else so keith used you as the front man on the line right yes richmond did he used me all him no, and mark yeah. King used to, we, we should run the ball more yeah and I would say that at an interview, and then she was like, what are you in there talking about? Why did you put that in the paper? Ugh. Well, it's true. We all feel that way. I'm just the one that has to say it, you know. But it's okay. I didn't have a problem with Shula. We had a great relationship, so no problem there. Last one for me. Best opponent you faced. Best D-lineman you faced. Best D-lineman I praised. Okay, you ready? This is okay. funny because my offensive line coach in Washington was Russ Grimm. And we, he asked me the same question. And you'll be shocked, we had the same identical answer. Jerome Brown, defensive tackle from the Hurricanes. He was at Philadelphia. That defensive line was Clyde Simmons, Reggie White, crappy Mike Golick, and Jerome Brown. <laughs> Why crappy Mike Golick? Because he was terrible compared to the rest of those guys. Oh, yeah, those guys if were... you had Mike Golick on you and he made a tackle, we belittled you for a week. <laughs> he was that guy. And I love Mike. He's a great guy. But Jerome Brown, strong, quick, mm -hmm. like Cortez Kennedy was. But Jerome Brown just didn't play hard all the time. My rookie year, we had a gauntlet. I don't know if you remember my rookie year, they made Richmond and I start every preseason game. We got three plays off the entire preseason. Three plays. Got you ready. So we're, we're I'm crying about it. Got you ready. Oh, it was. John Sandusky got us ready. We're, um, we're in Philadelphia. We're playing. I'm blocking Jerome. First quarter, I'm like, man, this guy's not very good. I got him, blah, blah, blah. Thank goodness Scott Mitchell comes in the game in the second quarter. So Jerome Brown decided – I don't know what somebody said to him. was it me. He decided to come hard. And that was the first time in my life I'd ever been forklifted. He took me, lifted me up at 309 pounds, drove me back into Scott Mitchell's lap and threw me on the ground. And I'm like, that was my welcome to the NFL moment. That one in Chicago before. It I was, was like, holy moly. You said it was a preseason at that time? It or was preseason. Yeah. Preseason. You wasn't playing hard and you disrespected him. That's what happened. And I'm like, oh, my. I'm like, these guys are men up here in this league. This is different. This is a little bit different than the old Big Eight here. So I, I covered him at the yeah, U. Jerome Brown. Unfortunately, he died in that car crash. Or he would have been a Hall of Famer. Yeah. He would have been I a Hall of Famer. Him in he wasn't. Keith, I covered him at the U when his head coach was none other than Jimmy Johnson. But no, I understand. I understand. You know, I give my props to Cortez. We didn't face each other that much, but unfortunately, he's not with us either. But Cortez was a great defense. For me, at, at six foot three, 
there weren't that many defensive tackles that were shorter than me, which gave them leverage. So mm -hmm. I was able to handle most of those guys. But as you know, leverage in the trenches is everything, especially as we say as a guard, you're fighting in a phone booth in there. You so, think that's why Aaron Donald is, is as productive as he is, the leverage element? He's a student of the game. He's a master of technique. He's toned his body. He's ultra quick. And all those things together. He's he's something special. I mean, obviously, he's a Hall of Famer. He is not many guys his size. Him and a guy like John Randall, if you remember John Randall, who's an undrafted free agent and mm -hmm. made it to the Hall of Fame. Another small guy, quick, smart, and a great motor. John Randall used to drive you crazy in the Pro Bowl. He would go hard. We're like, what are you doing at the Pro Bowl? You know, but he was going that hard even in the Pro Bowl. Since you brought up John Randall, did you ever go against him? John Randall, of course, yeah. But, well, okay, because he, he was famous. The great story I ever heard about John Randall is he would study the media guide to come up with personal info to talk crap during the game. So obviously, I have to ask you. He, he, would, he yeah. would be on the field, he'd be like, ha! Right before every snap, he'd stick his tongue out and you yell at him. John, it's not going to bother me. Now it might bother somebody else. But yeah, we had some we had some battles. I don't think I ever gave him a sack to John, but but it was tough. We had some tough games going to Minnesota in that dome. That was a rough place to play. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Keith, we definitely appreciate your time. Good luck coaching your son. Um, that is, hey, so he's still a freshman, right? He's still his freshman year, getting ready for sophomore year. So looking forward to that this August, though. Is is he doing the summer camp circuit? We are going to start to do that, I think. You know, it's one of those things he says he wants this. I took him out to Iowa State the last couple. I took him out two years ago when we played Texas and we beat them. And I took him out this year. We played TCU on a Sunday night or a, a, a Saturday night game. It was unbelievable. And I have to, you know, Iowa State is really, really good to me. I'm in the Hall of Fame. We go out there, roll out the red carpet. We tour the whole facilities. We're walking through the facilities and they're like, Hey, we got something special to show you. I'm like, okay. So I go in the offensive line room and they got five offensive linemen on the wall. I'm in the middle. I mean, it's eight feet tall by four feet wide. And so we take pictures and he wanted to go in the defensive line room. So we're walking down the hall and they're like, Oh, Matt Campbell, the head coach is in his office, but he's in a meeting. I was like, don't bother him. But he comes out and spends 10 minutes with my son and me. And we talk arm around Bob. Your legacy, we're going to follow you, that kind of thing. Told him what to do as far as he should run track. And so I'm like, I love it. And my son's like, I'm going to go to Iowa State. I'm like, oh, hold nice. your horses here. <laughs> hold your horses. That's fine. I said, and they're going to follow you. But you understand the work that has to go in to getting there. But he's like, I definitely want to do that. So I said, okay, we'll go back again this year. He said, we, you got to take me a Dolphin game, Dad. I haven't been to a Dolphin game in a long time. I'm like, true. So hopefully this year. I can get down there, you know, after the season's over and we can go to a Dolphin game and you can see that experience too. So They'll roll, they'll roll out the red carpet for you, Keith, because you are yeah. a red carpet. But we'll see if he, you know, I, I he has ability. He's just got to get bigger. He's a smart kid. He 3.9 last semester. He Because all my kid, low, lower kids were homeschooled. This is the first time he's ever been in school this fall. So he adapted okay and he, he's doing well. So. Ooh, what happened? What happened it's like, there? It's like we just lost Keith. Oh, we, we got him back. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so I know it was a lot different now with recruiting. You got to be on X. You got to contact schools. You got to go to camps and all those things. So maybe I'll take him out to Iowa State. You know, maybe we'll do a, a Kennesaw State here in Georgia, something local, that kind of thing, just to get his feet wet. But I just want to. I want to see how he does. Yeah, it, it, when they start to see the level of competition and they start to mm -hmm. see, you know, okay, that's the best guy, and then they see how they do against that guy, it kind of kind of fuels them a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or, or, But to me, football, if your heart is not in it, don't, oh, do, yeah. do not play that sport if your heart ooh, is not in it. Ooh, especially not beyond high school. It's hard enough in high school, but my older son – his heart wasn't it. He was all Broward County defense. He went to Calvary Christian, did really well there, turned down D2 scholarships, ended up going to St. John's in Minnesota, a D3 school, never played a down. He was playing JV his freshman year, broke his ankle, and I told my wife when he called me and told me he broke his ankle, I said he's done with football because he doesn't like to work. And he, he did the least he possibly could do to stay on the team because even though it was D3 – and it was $53,000 a year to go to that school. They gave him $43,000 in financial aid. And he was a B student. 
I'm like, okay, it's because you're playing football. They gave you this money. So he stayed on the squad for, and graduated, but never played it down for that school. Interesting. Because his heart wasn't in it. He did not want to work and do it. And I, I told him, don't go to college and play football if you don't really want to do it. It's a full-time job, but yep. it is what it is. So, And that's why they get compensated now. $4 million. Yep. Come on. That's a little, little extra. But Not hey, little much. L- little much. Well, we appreciate your time, Keith. We thank you for joining the All Dolphins podcast. As you guys know, our work you can find for free. No paywall. No subscription required. No monthly charge to your credit card. Um, you could, Poop Art is there. And I am promising you I'm going to have the Tua quarterback – analysis i see i've been it's a lot of study in these contracts because keith you know everybody's talking about these quarterbacks are making 50 million dollars oh i know they're not making 50 million dollars no they're they're making 42 Mm -hmm. 44 but you know how these agents talk and they talk of course but you know uh, that's a tough i I don't envy the dolphins because i've listened to your debate on your shows and i kind of land with you guys where it says play that fifth year option you can franchise them and then see, because that's going to kill your salary cap long term if you you tie yourself. And I, I want to to be successful. I can remember watching the we were on a cruise two years two years ago. My son and I watched a national championship game on a Disney cruise. So I, I was all for Tua. I was tanking for Tua. Fine, bring him on. But like you said, there's there's a few holes. There's still questions remaining whether he is truly long-term franchise guy where you want to invest 250 million dollars in this guy yeah we, we we shall see how it plays out yeah see i'm i'm sorry 60 million over two years i'm not crying for you and nobody else oh. on the team will cry for you no definitely so, not. and 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 his mentality and his mannerism is is not to cry and complain about his situation mm-hmm. so we'll, we'll see how this summer plays out but keith we thank you we appreciate you again you can find all our work all dolphins.com and, and good luck for the rest of the season and spring football for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. I'll see you. Hopefully I'll see you guys in the fall when I come down for a Dolphin yeah. game. You, you got to get us Richmond Webb so he can come on all Dolphins. We can do this campaign for him because he is the next Dolphin in line for he the Hall be. of Fame. Oh, absolutely. I, absolutely. You know, he should have been, no disrespect to Jason or Zach, but his he should have been in already. He should have been there. So now I it's think when you had Jason and Zach, you have to put them at the top of the line. And then Zach took us a what? How yeah. many years did Zach take? Zach yeah. took us a while. Yeah. You're Zach right. Took, and you can't be campaigning for no, you gotta pick guys. one. You gotta pick one to campaign for. Yeah. So it'll be so now it's time. Too. Yeah, definitely. All well, right. I can tell, I'll text Richard when I get off the phone and say, hey, you gotta you tell gotta him. We, we we'll do we'll we I we saw we'll treat him, him nicely. I, we'll treat him nicely. Yeah, yeah. I saw him at the joint practices mm-hmm. with the Houston Texans. Okay, yeah. And literally, I think I shared a picture because it was a joint practice. They stick us in the corner, and there was a mountain of a human being who <laughs> literally was blocking my view. I, I he like he blocked the whole field, and oh, I was yeah. like. Who is this guy, and why is he not on the football field? He's a tremendously large human being. And the Dolphin fans are like, that's Richmond Webb. I was like, that's Richmond Webb? Oh, yeah. and, and, then, and then we had a correspondence on Twitter, and it's like, like, man, you are a large human being. Oh, like, yes. He made me look small, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we appreciate it, Keith, and thank you again. Alldolphins.com. No subscription, no paywall, and you know how to find the podcast. And we appreciate you all for supporting us and continue to support us. And we'll continue to give you good content as we go on for the summer. But free agency is coming up, so we'll be here. All right.